Welcome to Comics TV, where your weekly guide to the comic book universe. I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Steve Persbella. Each and every week we bring you the hottest up-to-date news, reviews, and previews that we can. In a recent announcement, Skybox re revealed that an extremely limited number of cases produced for Ultraverse 2 Origin trading cards. Only 3,975 10 box cases of the cards will be made. Each case will be individually numbered to prove it. This is the smallest number of cases ever run in Skybox's history. And one of the respects for the cases, the reason they're doing this. It's to represent the life of 3,975-year-old Rune, legendary artist Barry Windsor Smith's popular new Ultraverse character. Now Comics has recently acquired the comic book rights to Three Ninjas Kickback, the sequel to the popular 1992 feature film. In the tradition of quality movie adaptions such as Ghostbusters 2, Fright Night, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, Free Jack, and Universal Soldier, now we'll be producing a three-issue miniseries based on the latest escapades of Colt, Rocky, and Tum Tum, the Three Ninjas. Now veteran Clint McElroy will be adapting the screenplay into comic book format. In a rare personal appearance, Batman loomed over the Skybox booth at the pre-Super Bowl Coca-Cola Card Show 5 on January 29th and gave out prototype cards previewing the new Batman Saga of the Dark Knight trading, trading cards by Skybox. The prototype card features exclusive artwork and are UV coated on both sides and individually numbered. There was only 50,000 of these cards printed. Warp Graphics publisher Richard Peeney announced the release of Rogue's Challenge, the long-awaited ninth volume in the ElfQuest graphic novel series. Rogue's Challenge focuses on the life and times of Rayek, the magic-wielding sun villager who becomes master of the lost palace of the High Ones. The volume includes a tale of his most distant ancestor, chronicles the trials and tribulations of his youth, in the desert village of Sorrow's End and concludes with an epic clash that pits him against Cutter, chief of the Wolf Riders. Though it consists primarily of material released uh, previously published in comic book form, ElfQuest Hidden Years issues number six through nine and a half, Rogue's Challenge also includes new art and story by ElfQuest creators Wendy and Richard Peeney done exclusively for the collection. In addition to the Wendy and Richard Peeney, uh, in addition to them, Rogue's Challenge will feature contributions from John Byrd, Sarah Byam, Paul Abrams, Charles Barnett III, Patty Cockrum, and Suzanne Dechnik. The hardcover volume retails for $19.95 and ships February 24th, 1994. Okay, each and every week I do the mainstream review. And to start this week's show, I'm doing Venom, Enemy Within, number two of three, by Marvel. Writer is Bruce Jones, artist is Bob McCloud. It sells for $2.95. This is the second action-packed issue of this Enemy Within series. This one deals with little goblins taking over the city and attacking Venom and Morbius. Well, this one starts out where Venom ends up getting teleported down into this cave, which is a subway, and finds all these little green goblins. Yeah, green goblins. And uh, Morbius is sitting on a throne. So right away, he assumes that Morbius is taking over, controlling these little green things, and Morbius thinks, well, Venom's controlling these little green things. Then you get your basic, okay, I'm gonna punch them, rack them, sack them type fight. Well, all of a sudden, they both realize they're fighting each other for no reason. Along comes Demo Goblin. They think now he's controlling it, but he is not. 
the power of Paleen, which is this goblin god, which they're leaving green little faces all over the city. This one was pretty good. The story of this one was pretty good, even though it lacked a little bit. This was a typical Venom, Rackham Sackham type book. Um, the dialogue in this one was good. The art in this one was absolutely excellent. Venom is drawn very, very good like he is. As you can tell, he is one of my favorites. Da -da -da. Interest level was excellent. It kept your interest level up from beginning to end. There wasn't a boring page in here. The action level was excellent. Realism, very, very good. Humor, it was good because when Morbius and Venom realized that they're fighting each other for stupid reasons, they become best of friends. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. Um, color was excellent in this book. This is very, very bright. The colors are very, they come right out of the pages at you. Target audience for this one will be Marvel fans, Venom fans, Morbius fans. Um, like I said, this is just another series out there that basically someone going in to look, hey, they're going to open it up and like it. So, And uh, overall, great on this one. Very good, but it could be a little better. This book still lacks a little bit, but this one was a very good, and I definitely recommend going out and buying this one. For my second one, here we go back into that line of my favorite books. Aliens Labyrinth, part four of four by Dark Horse Comics. Jim Woodring is the writer, Tillian Plunkett is the artist, and Monty Sheldon is the inker. Interesting names. Uh, cost is two fifty. This is part four of four, which explains the story of Dr. Church and his experiment with alien domination. With his test subjects, McGinnis and Lieutenant Crispy, Crispyzy, sorry, not Crispy, well, he was Crispy in the book, um, to find out who is the supreme between the aliens or humans. Church thinks he has lost, but at the end, has he really lost? This one, it, it sort of explains what happened to Dr. Church, how he became so interested in the aliens. It showed that he was captured by the aliens and the colonial marines came down, had a big war. Everybody was killed, including the aliens. He had one of them inside of him. He operated on himself for seven hours to cut it out because it was dead. I do that every day, you know? And it really goes in depth into the alien series, but the story was good in this one. The dialogue was poor. It just, it lacked. Even though it explained things, it lacked. Um, the art was very good. It, the alien is drawn very different in this one compared to the usual aliens. Interest level was good, and I'm leaving it at good because you could be halfway through the book and get bored. But hey, uh, action level was very good. Realism was very good. Humor, there's none whatsoever, unless you like, like I said, watching somebody operate on themselves for seven hours. Um, color was very poor. This is very bland. Uh, a lot of browns, greens, and blacks. I mean, it was very, very poor. Target audience, I would have to say only somebody who collected the first three issues of this series. I don't think anybody would just run out and buy this issue because it's a number four, plain and simple. Overall grade is going to be a poor to a good, only because, like I said, the color, and it's just another one of the Alien series, which I got into that about how many series are being released at the same time, but this was a poor to a good. And that's it on my mainstream review. And next, Mike will do the independent. Right, my first book this week is called Exo Squad. It's number zero from Topps Comics. Joe Stan is the artist. Len Wine, who has been around for many years, is the writer, and Bill Anderson does the inks. The cost on this is one buck, dollar twenty-five in Canada. That's because there's only eight pages in the story. It's based on the new hit TV animated series. It gives the background on how the um, how there was a rebellion by the Neo Sapiens. They were artificially conceived uh, beings bred to thrive on Mars and Venus by the humans. Uh, they were stopped in this rebellion, but 50 years later it begins again. And basically, this this book just gives you an overview of that and uh, outlines what's to come. The story. Uh, the dialogue, interest level, they were all good. Um, the humor was good, the color was very good. It's a very bright book, there's a lot of colors in it. 
The realism is good. Action level is good. It's got a lot of action in it, uh, considering it's a short short story like that. Uh, the art I found to be quite good too. Uh, the series. Uh, Series watchers who, who watch the series, sci-fi readers, uh, maybe people who like reading the teams, different team books, uh, they might like this book. Overall grade, I give this one a good. It's not a bad book. Uh, Buck, uh, it's borderline there with that price, uh, considering it's a very short story. But it's not a bad book, and I'd give it a I'd give it a look. My second one this week is called Last. Ditch number one. This is from Edge Press. Um, Bachelor, that's his whole name, I don't know where else he comes from, and Tim Harris do, do the art, which includes the inks, and Charles Calden does the writing in this book. It was $2.50, postpaid, since you probably won't find it in any stores, it's only available mail order. We previewed this several months back in its unfinished form. We had a black and white copy of this book. And at the time, Steve said it reminded him of... Chud, Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. And if you remember that, then, then I'll tell you that uh, the story revolves around uh, three, separate, three separate stories, actually. There's three separate parts. It's set in 1997, and it involves an unseen alien creature that is eating living beings, animals, humans. The story's good. The dialogue is poor. I thought that the dialogue could use some serious work. The interest level was good. Action level, good. Realism was good. That's definitely geared towards that sci-fi reader type of, type of person. There was really no humor in this book. It's a black and white book. The art was good, it had good art. So overall, I, I give it a good, even though the uh, dialogue was poor. I think with a little work, this could be quite a good book. All right, this week we've got a little added special. We've got a little media review. This is called Fanboy, the Journal of Comic Fandom. It's issue number three. It's published by Fan... It's published by Fanboy Magazine. Uh, it's created by several different people, but Mark Braun is the publisher. It's $1.95. It's a black and white book printed on newsprint. Fanboy is printed in comic book size. In this issue, I don't see anything you wouldn't find in any of the other magazines that are out on comic books. There's an interview with Jill Thompson, and there's an interview with Tony Akins. Uh, there's some interesting stories on violence in comics, on BBS seeing how you can uh, contact comic people and stuff, and a question regarding putting Superman on a stamp, and they have a little mail-in thing, send in your response to this. It's 32 pages, black and white, printed in Chicago with ads from Chicago area stores. It's, it's not a bad magazine, uh, not really anything different though, but if you're sick of, sick of the hero wizard kind of stuff, might be something to check out. This is The Door Review. This is where we take a look at two books that each of us read, and we compare notes to see if we like them or if we don't like them. And anything can happen now. This week, we start out with Nightmark Mystery Special. It's number one of one. It's from Alpha Productions. It's written by Christopher Mills. DCR is the artist. That is the name of the person. <laughs> and the cost is 250. The first story is called Devil's Brood, which is about a missing child that PI Nightmark must help find. But he finds more than just the child in this story. There's also a sick six-page text story that I didn't really read because when I buy comic books, I want to read comics. I don't want to read novels. But this was a very good book. The story was very good. Dialogue was very good. Interest level was very good. 
action level very good, realism very good. Art was excellent. This looks like it's drawn in pencil and is very, very realistic. Target audience would be horror readers, adult readers, science fiction readers. There's a lot of different people that could be classified in this type of book. Uh, the humor, there was none. It, well, actually, there was very little, which made it poor instead of having none. It's a black and white book, great horror story, excellent art. The scenes even look real in this. Uh, I like this one. I give it a very good overall. And Steve, well, what do you think? This is a combination between Casper and The Exorcist. <laughs> this, this really was. It was a combination of a whole different bunch of horror stories that probably everybody's seen different movies. Uh, you got little ghoulies in there. And you got one head ghoulie that reminds me of the little kid from uh, um, well, The Omen. The little kid standing there. He's so, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's nonchalant and all of a sudden I'll come I up. I thought his name was Damien or something. It is. Yeah. Well, it's Danny, but he called him Damien. Um, this is a good book, like Mike said. I actually enjoyed this book. It's drawn a lot of shadow. It's sh like shadow drawing actually is what it is, all pencil sketch. But the artwork was fabulous in this. For uh, Independent, it was very, very good. I'm going to agree with Mike this week. And I would recommend picking up this book if you can find it. I would definitely recommend that. It's by Alpha Productions, and uh, some stores do carry some of theirs. They're available through the uh, major advance and previews, so you can find it. Yep, definitely. Okay, next on my review. Under a Yellow Sun by Clark Kent. A graphic novel, a 64-page prestige format one-shot book from DC. The writer is John Francis Moore. Sells for $5.95, which I thought was a little bit pricey, but like I said, this is a first of Clark Kent's kind. He wrote his own novel. Uh, this one deals with Clark Kent is going after Lexicorp like he does in, every, or not Clark Kent, Superman, like he does in every book. And the story, uh, how can I put, um, it, it runs back and forth between Clark Kent and Superman, and this other character named, what was his? Traeger. Traeger. And Lex Luthor. And Lex Luthor. Everybody is combined. Lex Luthor hires this Traeger to protect him. He wants to hire Superman. Superman wants nothing to do with it. He's wanted Lex Luthor for the longest time. This really, really goes into depth. I really like this book. The storyline in this was very, very good. Like I said, it's like three different stories combined into one. Uh, the dialogue in this was very, very good because I picked it up. I couldn't put it down. I had to keep reading. It just it was one of those books where you just kept reading. The art is good. It's not excellent, but it's good. Interest level was very, very good. It, like I said, it definitely kept your interest level up. Action level was very good. There was every other page, there's at least one fight scene or something going on. Realism was very good. Humor, good to minimal also. Uh, there was some humor in this. Um, color was very good. And target audience, would I would definitely say Superman collectors and DC freaks, plain and simple. Uh, my overall grade DC I was going to say was... Uh, I'd say very good. This, like I said, was a first one of its kind, and it was very good. And I gave this a very good grade. And what did you think, Mike? Um, I thought that this was uh, a, a good book, just like Steve said. Um, I found it very unique in that uh, a lot of times one page, the left side would have the novel that Clark Kent was writing, and the right side would be the Superman story, yeah. which were like identical. They were like following the same thing. So basically, the whole story like mirrors each other. Clark Kent's writing a story based on his life as Superman and adding characters and changing and names and yeah. stuff. And it's a, it's a very good story. But there, there's a section in the book I had a laugh. Superman gets thrown through a window of a bookstore and all of a sudden he looks to the side and his one book that he just released was marked down in the markdown bin for three ninety five and he got all aggravated because here's his book sitting there for three ninety five. It was funny the way they were yeah. showing that. Yeah, he was running through the whole story, he's trying to stay away from his press agent because he's supposed to have the book done and he hasn't even gotten first page. Started, yeah. yeah. But uh, by the time this is over the book is done and everybody's happy. But it, it's it was good and you get his autograph. autograph. <laughs> 
to get Clark Kent's autograph. <laughs> it was good, though. Yeah. And that's it on the dual review. Yeah. the comic book hall of fame marvel comics number one from timely it was originally dated october 1939 most copies have a black circle stamped over the date on the cover and inside with november printing over it however some copies do not have the november overprint and could have a higher value most number ones have printing defects such as tilted pages which cause trimming into the panels usually on the right side and bottom Covers exist with and without gloss finish. Timely Comics was the first publisher to hit with a smash twin bill in their inaugural title. From the onset, the formula of icon iconoclast as hero would prove to be Timely's most successful newsstand strategy. The Human Torch and Submariner won immediate reader approval, paving the way for more marvels to come from the preeminent thrill factory of comicdom. Possibly the most sought after of all Golden Age comics is this book. The title lasted for over 10 years. In this issue, The Origin of the Submariner by Bill Everett, which was the first newsstand appearance, and the first eight pages were produced for Motion Picture Funnies Weekly Number One, which was probably not distributed outside of advanced comics. The introduction of The Human Torch by Carl Burgess Kazar the Great, the first Tarzan clone, and Jungle Terror. These were all introduced in this book. Also, the angel by Gustafsson, the masked raider, and his horse Lightning. These were all in here. There was a lot of, a lot of different things in this book. Interviews with Burgos and Everett. Lastly, worth anywhere from $7,900 for a good copy to... <laughs> $63,000 for a near mint copy of Marvel Comics number one from Timely. Only 50 copies are known to exist for a near mint, mint condition. Okay, we're ending this week's show on a sort of a sad note here. Jack Kirby, the creator of most all comics, a god amongst comics, uh, died last week. The article was taken out of, uh, I believe it's New York Times, and I'm going to read it to you. Thousand Oaks, California, February 7th. Jack Kirby, an artist who helped create the popular comic book characters Captain America and the Incredible Hulk, superheroes with humor and characteristics for a new generation of readers, died on Sunday at his home. He was 76 years old. The cause of the death was heart failure. Mr. Kirby was one of the artists credited with re, uh, reventilating superheroes in the 50s and the early 60s by portraying them as more human and even more vulnerable instead of being uh, superhumans. Under his influence, comic book storylines, which had extraditionally been short, were expanded to leading the issue length format, which nowadays is your long issue format. Kirby is to comics what Louis Armstrong was to jazz and Greg Tarkington or Greg Texton, who publishes comic books through his New York-based company, Pure Im Imagination, sorry, they were both at their birth of a new art form and strongly influenced, even though it was denied that he stayed alive. Don't ask me what that means. Mr. Kirby, whose original name was Jacob Kerbowitzberg, Kurtzberg, I'm sorry, was born in New York City in 1917. He began work in the comic industry in the 1930s. By 1940, he had teamed up with Joe Simon, his partner, for the next 15 years. In 1940, they created Captain America. And in 1942, they produced Boy Commandos Comics. That story about a young soldier sold a million copies per issue. After World War II, Mr. Kirby and Mr. Simon teamed up again to create popular romance comics. Jack Styles was no, Jack Style was dynamic, said Mr. Simon. He brought the action drawing to a new level. His style was limited all over and still today with a certain extent. 
1958, Mr. Kirby went to work for Marvel Comics, where he collaborated and dialogued writer-editor Stan Lee. They created such characters as the Mighty Thor, Incredible Hulk. In the early 70s, began work on a long series of DC comic called Mr. Miracle, New Gods, and Jimmy Olsen. After another stint with Marvel, he helped design animated films including Thundar the Barbarian and Fantastic Four, the animated television series. His last full-length comic appeared in 1986. And it's sorry to say that he was like a god of all comics. Him, Stan Lee, Joe Sinat, and we are definitely going to miss him. And this show is definitely dedicated to the art of Jack Kirby. Thanks, Jack. We'll miss you. And that's it for this week. Yes. And as I say every single week, next time you patronize your local comic shop, buy a book, read it. Just don't throw it in a bag, throw it on a shelf. Let your mom hit it with a vacuum cleaner, which I haven't said in a while. But read it. Take care of it. So next time you patronize your local shop, tell them you've seen it on Comics TV. See ya. Bye-bye. Write to us. Tell yes. us what you think. Yes. Two.